Thanks, Joe, for reading, and Abby. Um, please keep those, uh, that passage open. Maybe you want to turn back to 256, uh, Judges chapter 13. Um, Judges, chapter six, uh, Judges chapter 13. Let me pray for us as we look at God's word together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is living and active sharper than a double-edged sword. Lord, we pray that as we read and think about your word, that we would hear you speak to us. Lord, that you would please uh, speak to um, our hearts and minds. Help us, Lord, to have hearts and minds which are willing to listen and to be obedient uh, in what you say. Father, we pray you would please change us this morning as we read your powerful, living, active word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Well, it's often said that the the older you get, the more cynical you become. Perhaps some people would say that's just wisdom. Um, Others would say it's the reality of experiencing many disappointments. You know, for all of us, life doesn't turn out the way we expect, does it? And a lifetime of expectation followed by disappointment, it can get rid of all kind of hopefulness, can't it? It can lead to pessimism, it can lead to bitterness. And I think we can be like that with God to some extent, cynical about God's promises. You know, in life you learn, don't you, that the things that seem too good to be true always are too good to be true. What about God's promises? Um, Are we really that forgiven? Is God really going to sort everything out once and for all? Um, Does God really love me, knowing what I'm like and what I've done? And do we really have nothing at all to do to receive God's salvation? Just just accept it as a gift. I wonder if you can relate to those sorts of thoughts. Think about what it would have been like for God's people living through the time of judges. I can imagine that a faithful Israelite would struggle with cynicism about God and his promises, don't you think? Because imagine seeing your nation turn away from God and then seeing them suffer at the hands of their enemies and then God having raised up a a deliverer, having your hopes raised that that things are going to be different this time only to discover once again things just return back to the way they were. In fact, this this book of Judges, as we've read it these past few weeks, it's not just a circular pattern, it's it's a downward spiral, it's a nosedive into greater and greater sin. As the book goes on, the people in Judges get worse. And we saw last week in the story of Jephthah that by chapter 10, The Israelites were not just worshipping one false god, they were worshipping many, many different gods. And it's not just the judges who get worse, it's it's not just the people who get worse, it's the judges as well. So Othniel, he was the very first judge back in chapter 3, he was the gold standard, he was the poster boy for judges. But none of them have matched his bravery and his godliness since then. Every single judge has been worse than the last. So what are we going to get next? Will anything ever change? Will God really keep his promises? Imagine living through that period. Where would you be on the cynicism scale? Well, what we see in today's passage, in in, in this story of Samson, might have made God's people feel even more cynical. Because we're going to see in chapter 13, the promise of a rescuer who seems to be everything we need him to be. But the reality is just a massive disappointment. Samson is not everything we need a rescuer to be. Actually, he's everything we don't want him to be. He's all of the bad qualities of all the judges we've seen so far, all rolled into one. But I want to suggest to you that rather than fuel our cynicism, this passage should fuel our confidence in God. Because we're going to see that even when the rescuer is everything we don't want him to be, even then... God cannot be stopped. And we're going to see how Samson points us to our perfect rescuer, who was and is exactly the rescuer 
that we need. Have a look with me at chapter 13, the, the opening uh, verses. Have a look at point number one, the problem. Um, you can follow on the handout if you, if you want to. There's something very familiar about chapter 13, and yet also something unfamiliar about it as well. And let me read uh, the opening verses. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. And the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. I remember with me that the cycle of judges, I know if you've been around the last few weeks, you'll have heard it many times, but let's just go through it again. First thing that happens in the book of Judges, Israel's sin against the Lord. It happens every single time. And that's the same here. Verse one, Israel's sin against the Lord. And then God hands them over to their enemies. Again, that's the same here. But two things are missing that we have come to expect. Number one, we're not told that God, explicitly told that God raises up a rescuer. Although clearly that's what he is doing, isn't it, in chapter 13? But we're not told that. But more strikingly, number two, there's no mention that the Israelites cry for help. They just don't bother anymore. They're handed over to the Philistines for 40 years. 40 years of oppression. That is double the amount of time of any of their oppressors so far in this book. And I think there seems to be a sense that Israel have just grown accustomed to it. They've accepted it. Perhaps there's a cynicism. Nothing's going to change. So why put your hope in something that's never going to happen? Just turn over the page with you to chapter 15 and verse 11. Chapter 15, verse 11. Later on in this story, when Samson has begun to provoke the Philistines, he's started to fight them, he's got them angry. 3,000 men from Judah, that's 3,000 Israelites, come to him, to one man. 3,000 men. And if you look at chapter 15, verse 11, they kind of ask him to go away. They're saying to Samson, Please don't fight the Philistines. Chapter 15, verse 11. 3,000 men from Judah went, da- Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, don't you realize the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? They're saying to Samson, just leave things alone. You know, don't, don't try and do anything, please. You're just making things worse. Don't you realize we're ruled by the Philistines now? We've accepted it. Leave us alone. Leave them alone. This is a people who have given up hope. God is meant to be their ruler. Things are not the way they should be, but they've just accepted it. Now, the situation in Israel is mirrored by the situation of Samson's parents. Look again at chapter 13, verse 2. We meet Manoah and his wife, And ironically, Manoah's name means rest. It's the very thing that Israel lack. They don't have rest from their enemies. They're not enjoying God's rest. And Manoah's wife is childless. The hopelessness of Israel is mirrored by the the personal hopelessness and tragedy of this couple. You can sense the the, the hopelessness, I think, in verse 22. Look down to chapter 13, verse 22. This messenger has met with Manoah and his wife and promised them uh, the birth of a son. We'll, We'll come to him in a minute. But at this point in the story, Manoah has just realized, verse 21, Manoah's just realized the person they've met with, met with was the angel of the Lord. And immediately Manoah thinks the worst. He says, verse 22, we are doomed to die. He said to his wife, we've seen God. Now he's right in a sense. He's got good logic, sort of. But actually his wife realizes, verse 23, that what has happened to them is not the sentence of death from God, but a message of hope. And Manoah seems to be quite slow to grasp it. Actually, he seems to be quite slow to grasp anything in this chapter. But he seems particularly slow to grasp that God could be doing something good. 
And perhaps that's because he's lost all hope. Verse 23, but his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things, or now told us this. You see, she's saying, Manoah, look, God is doing something gracious and merciful amongst us. He's showing us kindness. This is not a message of despair. It's a message of, of hope. Look at verse 5, chapter 13, verse 5. God promises this boy who will be born will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. To a sinful people who don't deserve anything from God, God is promising a saviour. A saviour that nobody was asking for. A saviour that nobody wanted. But a saviour God knew that his people needed. A saviour that God was kind enough to give. A miraculous birth announced by an angel of the one who would deliver God's people. Sound familiar? This is what our God is like. And God is raising up a deliverer here without even being asked to do it. And he's going to do it in such an extraordinary way. He's going to bring a child to a childless couple. And I think the point is we are meant to realise this has absolutely nothing to do with Israel. It is not because of them. It's all down to God. It's his mercy and grace. To a faithless people who have given up hope, God makes the promise of a rescuer. Let's look, point number two. What are we told about this rescuer? What are we told about this rescuer? Look at verses four and five of chapter 13. And we're gonna, I'm going to read them. Don't worry, we are going to speed up soon, okay? We've got a lot to get through. We're going to speed up. But verses four and five are important because these are the instructions that God has given by this angel to Manoah uh, and his wife about their son. And it's clear from these instructions in verses four and five, this is a special boy, a special boy. Verse four, now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You'll become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now, if you're making notes, you might want to write down uh, Numbers chapter six, verses one to eight. Numbers six, verses one to eight. That's where you can find more details of what we read here about this boy being a Nazarite. Verse five tells us that a Nazarite is someone who is dedicated to God. Now, normally a Nazarite, an Israelite would, would take this Nazarite vow, a special vow, to commit themselves to God for a particular task or for a particular period of time. But this boy is going to be different, isn't he? Because he's not going to be a Nazarite for a particular task or a particular period of time, but from the womb. It's a choice, not that he makes, it's a choice that God makes for him. And he's set apart for um, a, a mission, but not just for a few days or weeks or months, but for his whole life. From the very beginning, he's to belong to God. Now, when someone put themselves under a Nazarite vow, the way they expressed their devotion to God, their set-apartness for God, was by following a particular set of instructions. So if you read Numbers chapter 6, you'll see what those instructions were. And there were three, three key instructions, three key ways you would demonstrate your devotion to God above and beyond the normal laws of, of Israel. Three key instructions. Here they are. Number one, don't cut your hair. Don't cut your hair. However long the vow was to last for, you can't go to the barbers or the hairdressers during that period of time. Don't cut your hair. Number two, don't eat or drink anything from a vine. So no wine, not even grape juice. Number three, don't touch a dead body. Not even if it's from someone who's in your family. Three rules, no haircuts, no alcohol, no dead bodies. And because this boy is going to be devoted to God from the womb, even his mum is given special instructions because what she drinks, he drinks. 
So she can't drink anything from the vine either. And she shouldn't eat anything unclean. Now, what, what, what's the significance of all of that? Well, the, the point is that this is meant to raise our expectations about what this boy will be and what he will do. It seems as if this boy is going to be the deliverer we have hoped for since the very beginning of this book. This is the climax of all the stories of Judges. It seems as if he's going to be holy. It seems like he's going to be set apart for God. He's going to be devoted to the mission of God. He's going to be righteous. He's going to be pure. He's going to bring about the salvation of God's people. And add to that the fact that this is a boy who's born to a couple who were childless, which links this story with other stories in the Bible of couples who were childless. Couples like Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Rachel, all people whose families and whose children were massively important in the Bible story. So do you see, our expectations at the end of chapter 13 are meant to be sky high for this boy. And then verse 24 and 25, the boy is born, he grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Samson looks like everything we would hope a rescuer would be. But the reality doesn't match our expectation. Let's look at point number three. And this is where we're going to move a lot more quickly through chapters 14 and 15. We have been given this measuring stick to, to, to assess Samson's life. We're expecting a righteous deliverer. That's what we want, a righteous deliverer. Someone who is pure and godly and holy. Someone who begins to save the people from their enemies. That's the measuring stick. How does Samson compare? Well, I would suggest to you it only takes him three verses to fail in both those categories. Instead of righteousness and deliverance, we get disobedience. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman amongst your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. Now, marrying foreign women outside of Israel was one of the things God had told his people they should not do. If they cared about following the Lord, they should not marry people who worship other gods. So we're expecting purity from Samson, but immediately we get disobedience. He does what is right in his eyes. Now that is an ominous phrase, isn't it? We are going to see it come up again and again in the next few weeks, in the next few chapters of this book. Samson does what seems right to him, but what seems right to him is not what seems right to God. And there are echoes of Adam and Eve here in the Garden of Eden. Samson sees something that is desirable to him. He sees a woman and he asks his father and mother literally to take her for him. Just like Adam and Eve saw and took what was good in their eyes in the Garden of Eden, Samson is doing the same thing here. He's not pure. He's not godly. He's disobedient. And instead of delivering from the Philistines, he's getting married to them. Now, as you read the rest of chapter 14 and 15, this pattern just continues. The same pattern of disobedience and disregard for God's mission. It's repeated again and again. And I would love to go through each of these stories um, in detail, but we haven't got time to do that. Let me just mention a few things. And look down to verse 5 to 9. There's this Strange episode, isn't there, with the lion. We're told that Samson tore the lion apart as he might have torn a young goat. I mean, I can't say that I've ever done either of those things. Tearing a young goat seems incredible to me. Tearing a lion to pieces is just, just astonishing. And in a sense, I think it raises our hopes for Samson, doesn't it? Samson is a superhero, 
He really is. Like he is more superhero than any of the judges so far. Just think about what he could accomplish with all that strength. But there are worrying signs as well. For a start, verse 5, why is he even near a vineyard? I mean, he's not allowed to drink anything from the vine, is he? I mean, maybe he's, maybe he just was passing that way, perhaps. But then why does he decide to go and look at the dead body of the lion a few days later? He's not meant to go anywhere near dead bodies, is he? And he certainly shouldn't be scooping honey out of them and passing it to his parents. Then uh, verse 10, there's this wedding feast for the woman that he shouldn't be marrying. And a feast would normally be the kind of place where they would serve alcohol. Samson isn't meant to drink any alcohol. Uh, But it's at the wedding feast, the wedding reception, that he sets his guests this riddle. Any good host is meant to put on some light entertainment for their guests, but but this is kind of a different sort, isn't it? Look at verse 12. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Now, In reality, there was no way they were ever going to solve the riddle, were they? Because the riddle was all about what he did to the lion and how he found the honey. How are they going to be able to answer that if they weren't even there? It's just unfair. But notice um, what happens next. The Philistines blackmail Samson's wife. And she persuades Samson to tell her the riddle. And she tells the Philistines and they win the bet. And Samson isn't very happy because now he has to find 30 suits and give them to his guests. This is a a turning into a wedding day to forget, isn't it? And so what does he do? Verse 19, where where are you going to find 30 suits on your wedding day? You can't pop to Gunwharf Keys to buy them. Verse 19, then the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Where are you going to find 30 sets of clothes on your wedding day? Well, Samson just kills 30 people and takes their clothes. Now, all sorts of things seem wrong with that, don't they? But not least the fact that Samson has touched 30 dead bodies. Can you see the pattern? Samson has absolutely no regard for his Nazarite vow. He doesn't care about being devoted to God. He's not righteous and he's not a deliverer. I mean, that's the interesting thing about this chapter, isn't it? This is not a chapter about Samson using his powers to deliver Israel. That's what we would expect. God raises up a deliverer and they deliver Israel. That's not what he's doing, is it? He's getting married, having parties and giving people riddles and then killing people because of it. Now, I guess you could say, you could say, by the end of chapter 14, he's killed 30 Philistines. That's true. So technically, I suppose he has begun to save Israel from the Philistines. But is this really the kind of rescue you'd envisage? Samson is not interested in delivering anybody, is he? These 30 Philistines were not killed to deliver Israel. They were killed because Samson was angry and he needed some clothes. It's revenge. Chapter 15 just continues the pattern. Look at verses 1 to 3, chapter 15. Samson manages to turn a family feud into a national crisis. Chapter 15, verse 1. Later on, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat, went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room. But her father would not let him go in. I was so sure you hated her, he said, that I gave her to your companion. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Samson said to them, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. I'm not not really sure Samson's got that right, has he? In revenge for his wife being given away to someone else, what he does is he, he destroys the entire Philistine crop harvest. It is not getting even, is it? This is just escalation upon escalation upon escalation. And it ends in chapter 15, verse 15, with a massacre. 
Look at chapter 15, verse 15. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Now that, that is delivering from the Philistines, isn't it? In a way. But Nazarite vow alarm bells should be ringing in our ears. A fresh jawbone? And did you see the pattern? Disregard for God, disobedience towards God, not devotion to God, disregard for his mission, disregard for his vow. Yes, he's killed a thousand Philistines, but not to save Israel. It's just to save himself. And it's revenge. Would you like Samson to be your leader? He is absolutely not the rescuer we are hoping for. He's the opposite. He's everything you don't want in a rescuer, all rolled into one. He's selfish. He's immoral. He's bloodthirsty. He's out of control. Now we need to, to step back and, and think about what we're meant to learn from this story. And as I said, there's, there's so many things we could talk about. So many fascinating details. What is the big thing that the author of this story wants to teach us? What is the thing that God wants to teach us? Well, three things I'm going to suggest for us to think about as we come to an end. Firstly, that there's a lesson about us, or rather a lesson about our sin. You know, one of the interesting things about Samson is how similar he is to the people of Israel. It's like Samson is an illustration of God's people. Because like Samson, God's people were set apart from birth, weren't they? God chose his people to be devoted to him. And they had rules to follow as well as an expression of their devotion to him. They had a mission to be a kingdom of priests in God's world. But just like Samson, they had no regard for their calling, for their mission. They had no regard for God. They married foreign women as well. We saw that earlier in the book, chapter 3, verse 6. All through this book, God's people have been doing what is right in their eyes without a care for what God said was right in his eyes. Now, what's the point of that comparison, Samson and Israel? Well, I think it means that in Samson, we see a picture of what it's like to live like that. We get to see what it's like to ignore your maker and to do what's right in your eyes. You know, our culture tells us that is precisely what we should do. Do what seems good to you. That's what we're told, isn't it? That's what we're told all the time. Do what feels right. Don't listen to anyone but your own feelings. Well, here in this story of Samson, we get to see what that's like when people live like that. We're going to get a few more chapters of it in the coming weeks as well. Samson is a scale model of what it's like to do what's right in your own eyes. He's impulsive. He's selfish. He doesn't have a care for anyone but himself. He's showing us the ugliness of sin. He's rubbing our faces in it. Isn't it awful? You know, when you see Samson, it is not good, is it? But that is what we're like at heart without God. That's the first lesson we need to learn this morning. Recognize the ugliness of our sin and flee from it. Here's the second. God is absolutely unstoppable. Nothing and no one will stop God. Think about it. Early in this book of Judges, God worked through the skills of his rescuers. Remember Othniel the brave, Ehud the assassin. And then things started to go a bit wrong. God didn't use Barak's great military might to rescue his people, did he? He saved despite Barak's reluctance and he saved despite Gideon's fear. But now do you notice here in Samson's story, God is saving people through the sinfulness and the weakness of his rescuer. Do you see that? He's using the flaws of his rescuer to bring deliverance. Just look with me at chapter 14, verse 4. 
It's one of the key verses in this whole passage. Just after Samson has told his parents that he wants to marry a Philistine woman, look at what we're told, chapter 14, verse 4. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling over Israel. See, Samson was just doing what he wanted to do. He did what Samson wanted to do. He was doing what was right in his eyes. He saw a Philistine, he wanted her as his wife. But God was doing something too. He was using this man, he was using his weakness, or more precisely, he was using his sinfulness to set up the means by which he would rescue his people. And we'll see how that plays out in in a couple of weeks' time in chapter 16. Now, that might be difficult to get our heads around that. That God can use the sinfulness of people to bring deliverance and salvation. But when you think about God, you need to have a category for what you read here. God is so awesome and powerful, he can use even the sinfulness of his people to achieve his purposes. God is unstoppable. Samson might not care at all about being a rescuer. I don't think he did. That is not going to stop God delivering his people. And that should encourage us this morning. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says uh, these remarkable words on the screen, I think. Paul says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Everything. That is what we see in the story of Samson, isn't it? So this story shouldn't fuel our cynicism about God. It should fuel our confidence in God and his plans and his purposes. He works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Finally, as we finish, lesson about our rescuer. We've seen a lesson about us, a lesson about God, a lesson about our rescuer. Samson's story, like all these stories in the book of Judges, should make us say this, hooray for Jesus. Because Samson is a very unsatisfactory rescuer. He is not righteous. He's not interested in rescuing. He's selfish, impulsive, obsessive, immoral, bloodthirsty. Our rescuer Jesus is pure and holy. He was tempted in every way and yet was without sin. He didn't come to earth for his own agenda. His deliverance isn't for himself. In fact, he gave up his life to rescue us. And Jesus will judge, but his judgment is not over the top bloodthirsty revenge. It is fair and appropriate and just. Let me finish by just reading to you some words from Isaiah chapter 11. Words about the Lord Jesus, and then we'll pray. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Isn't that the king that we need? Hooray for Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage, for this story of of Samson in whom we, we get to see this picture of of the ugliness of of sin, of what it looks like to live and just do what is right in your own eyes. Lord, that is our temptation every day, 
help us to see in this passage how wrong that is, how we need to listen to what you say, to do what is right in your eyes and not our own. And Lord, we thank you too that in this story we see on display your mercy and grace in sending a saviour that nobody was asking for, but a saviour that you knew people needed. Help us, Lord, to take encouragement from what you're like. We thank you that you have sent us Jesus and that your plans in Jesus are absolutely unstoppable. Help us, Lord, not to be cynical about your promises, but to have confidence in you. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is righteous and just and pure and godly and holy. Lord, would you help us to appreciate his character and to cling on to him each and every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.